Okay, well, welcome to this episode of Conversations on Hope. I'm joined by Professor Jeremy Begbie. Uh, Jeremy is Thomas A. Langford, Distinguished Professor at Duke Divinity School, Duke University, where he directs Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts. His primary research interest is in the correlation between theology and the arts, and in particular, the interplay between music and theology. He is also an affiliated lecturer in the Faculty of Music at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much indeed, Glenn. Good to be here. Well, wonderful. Let's, let's start out by, with the kind of a big question here. In your view, what is Christian hope? Christian hope is living in the light of Jesus Christ, hmm. in a nutshell. That's succinct. The, the light of his life, death, resurrection, and, and coming return. I mean, you've sort of said it all there with Jesus. Hope is an extraordinarily comprehensive doctrine. It's more than a doctrine, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, a way of imagining the world. Extraordinarily comprehensive. And I think a lot depends on holding a whole lot of things together. Mm. Uh, but that's it. If, if Christ himself, crucified and risen, is bypassed in any way, then a theology of hope disintegrates. Absolutely right. Well, I, I um, really enjoyed interacting with some of your material on music and emotions and a, a chapter that you've written called Faithful Feelings. How, how should we think about music and emotion, particularly in the context of, of worship? Well, one of the things, of course, that people value most of all about music is its emotional power. I think if you did a kind of survey, but you know, what do people get out of music or why they listen to it or why do they spend a lot of money on it, as most of us do, it, it, sooner or later you're going to come back to its emotional, uh, its emotional potential. But the relation between music and emotion is actually much more yeah. complex than we imagine. Um, and there's a great mm -hmm. deal of, um, there are many different theories about how music either generates or encourages uh, emotional states or emotional feelings in us. I think one of the things one has to get right, first of all, it's very much, of course, there will be, uh, you'll be an expert on this as well, but uh, is that emotions, properly speaking, are directed, to use the jargon, they are intentional. Yes. That is, yes. they are directed towards something. Yes. They're not simply private inner yeah. uh, periods of turbulence inside us. Uh, once we get past that, uh, and we get that into us, that, that the say joy, joy in itself is neither good or bad. Joy is, should be directed towards an appropriate object and be an appropriate response to that object. I was with my family the other day and they, we were talking about this. And, and one of my family was saying, look, it's surely if a person has an emotion, it's valid, what, whatever it is, it's, it's really valid to them. And I, was, I think I was trying to say that yes, it may be real to them and you must acknowledge that, but it may be quite improper. It may be yeah. uh, badly directed or quite out of proportion. Yes. I mean, if, if a mouse came into the room here now and I started screaming uh, wildly and running around the room and, um, <laughs> and jumping up on the table in terror, that's a, that's a bad, it's an emotion that's real to me, but it's, but it's ridiculous. It's out of proportion. Yes. Now in worship, therefore, it's important, whether it's joy or sorrow or lament or whatever it is, that really is directed towards the right end mm. um, and that it's in proportion. Mm. That it's not, that it's, it's true to, well, ultimately true to God, but there may be many other things in worship we need to be true yeah. to as well, but, but supremely that has to be God. Which you make this distinction between a mood and an emotion. A mood has yeah. no object. It's not directed. It's not aimed at anything. That's right. Now, there's a, again, there's a bit of controversy to be out there. But I think most would say you've got to have some kind of distinction between what you might call an emotional state where we don't know or we don't have an object in mind. I might just be feeling grumpy one morning, yeah. right. but I don't know what it is that I'm grumpy about. Mm. But, but an emotion is usually you're able to identify what it is uh, that you're grumpy about or, or you're bad tempered about. Yeah. But I th again, I think that's, that's an important distinction. What music can often do is, is encourage a certain kind of mood, mm. uh, but I don't think it becomes a fully fledged emotion until you've got something to be whatever it is, um, say joyful, sad about. Mm. 
So, so would that be like, let's think of a movie score, for example, if, if the, the music has no lyrics to it, but there's images that accompany the music. Yeah. Now, now we're evoking particular feelings and we're aiming them at a particular subject or, or object, as it were. Or in the worship context, perhaps it's, it's lyrics that, that help aim that. Would you? Most definitely. I mean, there's a good, very often in, you, in the example of film you use there, that it's very often that the images give us something to be emotional about, mm-hmm. as it were. Mm-hmm. And that the music perhaps nuances that or gives it a certain color or a tinge or whatever, and perhaps um, intensifies uh, uh, the emotion uh, that you're going to feel. And in worship, um, yes, indeed, that's very often. It's, that's, of course, why I'm not against music without words altogether in worship. You have to be slightly careful because in the, in the end of the day, you know, uh, Christianity is a verbal, is a verbal yes. faith. Yes. And that God has given us language yes. uh, to direct our attention to God. Mm-hmm. And the, the music that is just free floating, it's not always a bad thing, instrumental music, anything but. But if it's just free floating, it can, so to speak, attach itself to almost anything. Yes. And encourage yeah. an, an emotional response that may or may not be appropriate. Yes. Um, I mean, let's face it. Uh, it uh, I, I'm sure this doesn't apply to you, Glenn. But sometimes in, in worship, my mind actually wanders. Mm-hmm. And it's <laughs> important to have, whether it's words or images or whatever, or a sermon or Bible text, whatever, to, as it would direct our attention. And then music really can do its work, it seems yes. to me, helping us live more fully into the reality yes. that's being talked about or envisaged. Now, sometimes, I, I, and I've definitely, I've, the context that I'm in, I've seen that, a danger where the the music and the emotion is there, but we're not really clear about what we believe about Jesus or, or maybe the songs are a little thin on substance, but I've also encountered the oppo- opposite sort of um, experience where people have been too nervous about music. Uh, yes. I, have, I have some friends in a traditional uh, liturgical setting that didn't want to put music underneath the Eucharist liturgy because they thought that that's too emotional. What would you say yeah. to that? I'd say that, very often that fear comes because someone has seen an abuse mm-hmm. of music or seen it badly used. And th- for what, at least two or 3,000 years, there's been a very strong current of thought, not just Christian thought, but many other traditions, very strong current that, that music can stimulate our kind of emotional yeah. antennae uh, in very powerful ways. Yeah. And, and because they've seen that abuse, they say, let's get away from the emotion and into a certain kind of rationalism or whatever it is or, or obsession with words or verbal communication i don't think i think the fear is legitimate mm. the reaction to it is not very often mm. it's it's an overreaction it's not emotion we ought to be frightened of it's badly directed emotion or inappropriate emotion that is dangerous um and sometimes i think there's been so much music in worship it's quite good just to have a service without any music. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's a strange thing for a musician to say, but so much I just think it's, a, or we feel, we feel if we stop singing or playing for, you know, 30 seconds, God won't arrive or, you know, um, uh, the Holy Spirit will never come. I mean, that's, right. that's, that's ridiculous. God can, can manage without yes. that music yes. and in thousands, millions of services, the last 2000 years have had uh, no music and somehow, you know, people survive. It's quite <laughs> important to have the music taken away sometimes so that yes. um, paradoxically, then you appreciate it very much more when it does come in, or you think much more carefully yes. about, about how to use it. So very much a similar consideration with images, you know, people live in places where perhaps there's an, or have, have lived through something where there's an abuse of images, where they've been badly used or mm-hmm. overused. Uh, classically in the Reformation, you know, so, lot. so what do we do? We try to get rid of all yeah. images, but that's that's not the answer. It's understandable, and perhaps it's necessary sometimes. Yeah. But as a long term, a long term strategy, no, because we've got eyes, and using yes. images is a very natural part of being human, and and a wonderful way of uh, enriching our faith. Yeah. That's so wonderful, and I have found personally, you know, when I was leading worship more often with music and all of that. I needed for my own devotional life, I needed the more contemplative practices. I needed yeah, silence absolutely. and, you know, let me just say the Psalms instead of singing them. Absolutely. Or, you know. And I found that with working with many, many musicians, 
if I, if I were a pastor now, I'd be absolutely sure that musicians have really good time off. And I don't just mean time where they don't come to church or something. I mean that um, time where their responsibility to produce music is, take, is yes. removed from them so that they can worship in other ways. Yes. Um, and indeed, as you say, contemplative practices very often, I find musicians, it's so nice not to have to, to play, uh, you know, to produce these, these sounds just as it were, to, to let it happen to you and to, to say the Psalms very simply or say a passage of scripture. Yes, indeed. I think, um, I think we put an enormous, huge weight on our musicians very often, far too much. Mm. Um, and of course, sometimes, Frank, these musicians, you'll know well, you're having to concentrate on getting that F yes. drop in tune or, yes. or making sure the bass guitar is with you or whatever. And at the moment of leading worship, that's fine. That, that yeah. is your responsibility. Yeah. But if, if that's all you ever have, then you, you're going to lead a pretty impoverished spiritual life in the long run. You know, if that's all you've ever done. Yeah. That's words of wisdom, Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Conversations on Hope. Christians sing. In dark prison cells and in weekly worship, when hearts are buoyant and when all seems lost, Christians sing. This is what we do. And Christians sing because we are people of hope. But what kind of hope is it? And what exactly are we singing about when we experience this hope? Worship in the World to Come is a book that's been seven years in the making. It captures the essence of my doctoral research on how Christian hope is encoded in the contemporary worship songs that we sing and experienced in the worship services that we participate in. And the book is divided into four sections. The first section kind of sets the stage. It explores a little bit about what practical theology is and this model of putting together theory and practice. And then it looks at three contemporary paradigms of congregational worship. What are three contemporary ways of thinking about what the church is doing when it gathers together in worship? The next section is all about hope. Hope from various perspectives, from the cognitive and emotional, uh, from the philosophical to the theological. And then we move to part three, which is all about the songs and services that we participate in, evangelicals and Christian hope. The final section of the book is about the Holy Spirit and the church. How is it that the Holy Spirit is at work as we worship, giving us a foretaste of the future now, empowering us with a sense of agency? So join me in this exploration of hope and worship. Pick up your copy of Worship in the World to Come today.